for the blessings that you that you give us, Lord, each and every day, for your grace, Lord, for your mercy, Lord, that we um, that we so don't deserve, Lord, but that you freely give to us, Lord, um, because of your Son's um, sacrifice on the cross, Lord. We were um, now citizens of heaven, um, Lord. We are grateful for that, um, Lord. I pray that um, amongst our trials, Lord, and our hardships of life, Lord, that we will look to you, Lord, that we will find rest in you and you alone. Lord, our dependence will be solely on you, Lord. Um, and when all said and done, Lord, I pray that we'll be able to say, blessed be your name, Lord. So be with us in this place as we worship in your name. Amen. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, with streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be. Blessed be your name when found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Suffering, there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord blessed be Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name.
where the sin of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, 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 oh. It's like, who could stop the Lord? stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. Fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion. church. Glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. Thank you to our worship team and tech team for leading us into God's presence. And I'd ask you to take out your bulletins for just a moment. As the ushers come forward, we're going to uh, start the offering and then make a couple of announcements this morning. But we're glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for the privilege of worship here at First Baptist. Thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence as a church family. Pray that uh, you would be blessed by our worship, by every word and thought that we have this morning. Pray that you would be blessed by our giving uh, for our tithes and our offerings as a joyful offering to you. We give these in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we start the uh, announcements, I just want to pass a uh, sign-up sheet for the social in-between services each week. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to provide some food in between the services. It's an easy ministry to be a part of. And uh, if you don't know for sure what dates you're available, just sign up for one that looks good and you can switch it later. Uh, but I'm going to start this out right in the front here. Let me give that to you. All right. <clears throat> Now I'm going to have Bill come up and uh, talk about High Point for a minute. All right, the youth are going on High Point retreat um, this next weekend. Uh, we need to meet here at the church at 3 on Friday. Um, there is a packing list, some information that we sent home last Sunday night. So parents, if you didn't get it, smack your kids in the head and we will make sure that you get it. But you should have gotten information. We'll post it on the Break Free site as well. Um, so you got a packing list. There also will be a permission slip going home tonight that needs to be filled out and signed um, by parents. If you don't receive that, again, smack your kid in the head. No, really, we don't want you to smack your kids in the head. But, um, but make sure that you get those things. They, they both should have come home one should have come home last week. We will send another packing list tonight, and we will also make sure you get the permission slip. Because um, when you come on Friday at 3, if you haven't filled it out and signed it yet because they didn't bring it home, I'm going to make you fill it out and sign it before I let you leave out of the parking lot. So um, make sure you do that. Um, if there's any questions, get a hold of me or Abby um, during the week, and we'll make sure you get those forms. Um, also... 
we they're not giving us dinner when we go on Friday night they're giving us pizza like around 9 30 so on our way there we're going to be stopping at Sheets which if you don't know what Sheets is it's like Wawa so we're going to be stopping at Sheets um, and grabbing something to eat sandwich snack whatever the kids want so probably around 10 bucks should be good for them to get themselves something for dinner um, on our way up and that's over and above any money you would want to give them for I think they got snack shops or something there that they can have some spending money while we're there for the weekend um, and then we'll be back we leave there around 11 a.m. on Sunday so we'll let you know when we're leaving and we'll have them give you information so you know what time we get back thanks Bill for the announcement for leading the retreat I don't see a lot of youth here but I see a lot of prayer warriors so uh, be sure to be praying this weekend for our youth who are going to High Point this can be a real life changing event in their young lives and so uh, we want to pray for them so as we go through the rest of the announcements I'll just mention that uh, the caregivers day is coming up in March this is where we uh, invite parents who have special needs children to come and be pampered and as you'll see in the announcement it takes about 50 volunteers to do the caregivers day and they do all kinds of things for these parents and so if you don't think you can do anything there's probably something if you're available something you can do to help pamper these parents with special needs kids all you need to do is talk to Carissa and she'll figure out something that you can help with and if you can't be there on that day please pray that uh, these parents will be uh, ministered to and pampered as they deserve there's also um, they give out gift bags to the parents who come and so if you can't be there to help as a volunteer you can help fill the gift bags there's a box out here with um, things you can donate and uh, you can be a part of that again talk to Carissa if you'd like to help with that uh, they're going to High Point camp this weekend but there's also a summer camp at High Point that we send kids to so that announcement is in the bulletin and then finally our missionary to Sweden missionaries Tony and Gwen Martin will be Gwen will be back too right Gary, Pastor Gary okay Tony and Gwen will be back in the summertime can't wait to see them again uh, but they need a vehicle while they're home on furlough and so if you have happen to have a car that's you're not using for the summer um, talk to Pastor Gary about possibly having the Martins use that while they're home and then finally there are uh, annual reports out in the foyer we had our annual meeting this past week and it was a joy to see in the, in the reports how much God has been doing at First Baptist and so if you want to be a part of that joyful experience take a uh, annual report read through it see what God's been doing through the different ministries of our church uh, and be a part of that um, and you also get to see the budget what we've approved and what we hope for in the future so please take one of those uh, with you when you leave today thank you let's stand again
This sounds better. Good morning. Good to have you today. Today is a very special day for Lois and I. Um, it is, what'd you say? Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, yes. 30 years here at the church pastoring. Uh, we've, it was, um, actually, as I've, I looked it up on uh, just to, to see my sermons here because I'd been, I'd been here um, and preached on, uh, let's see, December 11th, 1988 was my first sermon here. Um, and that was because I got a frantic phone call. I put my resume in here like June. We were looking to move back this direction and nothing at all. And all of a sudden I get this frantic call. We, we need you to come here and preach. And I said, well, I'm scheduled in two weeks to preach someplace. Oh, someplace else? You got to come here first. Can you squeeze us in next week? You know, what's going on? Well, I found out later that um, the pastor had left here in January, which is why we put our, uh, our information here. But then an associate pastor was kind of holding things together. And while setting up for a WANA on a Friday night, he died in the church. Evidently had a heart murmur. Uh, he was a Navy vet and so forth. And uh, I don't know if anybody knew or whatever. It was totally unexpected. And so... All of a sudden, they're frantic because the guy, the guy that was holding everything together is gone. And so, anyway, so that was my first sermon here. And then um, back in, uh, on January 20th, actually, we were starting going through the book of John right now. And as I look back, we started John that very next, that beginning of the week. And um, John, uh, uh, January 20th, I preached on John 1, 1 to 14, which is what I preached, the same text I preached on a few weeks ago. And then after that, there was the, uh, uh, I preached on Ephesians 4, where it says, you know, we give some pastors and, prof- uh, pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And that was always so important to me. Because it, who are the ministers? I am, right. So, um, so that was my, my starting text when we preached on that week. And then I actually, uh, my first Sunday here was actually, we moved in Valentine's week, and February 19th was our first week to actually preach here. So we got a, a, uh, uh, when we came, and um, I have got a few old slides to show you what things looked like back 30 years ago. Um, this is Lois and I in the church parsonage, uh, in the stairwell of our new parsonage with our baby Caleb, who was a year and a half old. Remember him? Now? He's he's now six and a half, six foot five, uh, kind of thing. How old are you? How tall are you, Nick? Six six. You got to beat by an inch, okay? He was about as, Nick. Stand up. <laughs> Nick, I said, that's Caleb's an inch to, inch smaller than that. Now that's what he looked like. <laughs> oh, you six three. Oh, I thought you said six 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 three. So he's two inches higher than that, okay? Uh, I probably shouldn't say this joke, but he they always try to get him on the basketball team at Morrisville. And his, his expression was he played football for Mars for all the years he was there, or the last three years. He said, white kids can't jump. <laughs> that, that was his reason for not playing basketball. Next, next slide. Uh, this is Caleb uh, wandering around our, our home. Doesn't he look so cute on the right there? Um, that's my father actually sitting in the back. He can't see that. And then uh, next is the uh, picture, some uh, family pic. Uh, oh, no, actually, this is John, Jonathan and Carissa. Chris or John? Yeah, there's Chris up back there. She looks a little bit different now. Um, that's not Kenzie. You know, a little might look like that. And that's Jonathan. Uh, and that's all these are in uh, February of uh, 2000, uh, of 1989. The next one. This is some of our family pictures. Don't those kids look cute? I was back in that day. Uh, yeah, Joshua, you're only in the picture on the left. The one on the right was taken soon after here. We think that center one was taken Easter, our first year here. And then the next photo is, uh, is actually what I would really like to, really wanted to kind of emphasize. If we can get to the next uh, slide, guys. So there it is. Um, when I first came here, Marty, uh, I gave her a plaque and we recognized her in her first service. She usually sits right over here. Uh, church secretary, she, I came here and we had one of those, um, the, the um, uh, copy machine we had was one of about this size, like this, had the, had the glass top and you put something on the glass top and it would go over here and you'd have like 15 copies a second then it move back and do another, another copy. That's what we started with. She said, Pastor, I'll stay and help you for a couple of weeks through the bulletin. And she's still my secretary, so 30 years later. So don't ever say you're gonna help the pastor with the bulletin unless you really want a long-term plan. But uh, we've never paid her a penny. She's, uh, she's been faithful to us. Last couple of years she had a stroke, so she's not doing quite as much now. But uh, God's mar- marvelously, uh, she marvelously recuperated from the stroke. And she's still writing the checks for us and still comes in and does some stuff for me. Computer work is hard because of her left hand. But uh, anyway, I, I really appreciate Marty. And uh, so uh, if you see her around, thank her for 30 years of faithful 
incredible unpaid service as a volunteer secretary at the church. He's done a great job. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 3 today, and we've been going through John, and John chapter 3, the first part of it, he interacts with a man named Nicodemus. There, If you look through John, uh, there are uh, a number of miracles and a number of discourses or interviews. There's 11 interviews with people, and this one today with Nicodemus is one of the most important ones of all. And I think that's why John uh, makes sure that's his primary and just right uh, focused here. And I want to give you a little bit of background about Nicodemus as we start here, just to give you an idea of who he is. Um, as we look at him, his... Um, his, the first verse here in this text, and take out your Bibles if you want, if you will, because you'll be able to look at it a little bit more easily. But in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The word now there could actually but, and it's contrasting him with who was uh, mentioned in the first three verses prior to that at the end of chapter 2, verses 30, 23 through 25. It says, he did all these miracles when people believed on him, but then it says in verse uh, 34, as you, as you look there at that text, 24, excuse me, it says, but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, or was not believing giving himself over to them in belief. The word uh, in trust there is the same word as believing. Um, and they were beholding the signs and that's why they were uh, liking him. Nicodemus goes further than just seeing some miraculous signs. And he goes and actually sees uh, Jesus. The second thing I want to point out, and let's go to that slide, guys, if you can, about Nicodemus. I think it might be just before this. Um, it says, his name means actually conqueror or of or victor over the people. Not that it makes a difference in this context, but that's what his name means. His pedigree was that he was a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, was, and it says he's also a member, a leader of the people, leader of the Jews. He was probably on the Sanhedrin, which was a group of 70 men who ran basically the Jewish faith at that point in time. The Pharisees meant they were very, uh, there, are some, there are some Baptists that are very legalistic, okay, what they say. You've got a problem, a lot of different rules, and that's probably what the Pharisees are like. They, they, were, they were great in that the Sadducees didn't, believe, didn't hold to the Bible much. These Pharisees really held to the scriptures. They believed in the resurrection. Uh, they believed in future things, stuff the Sadducees didn't believe in who were the liberals of the day. But they went extra far. And they had all kinds of rules and regulations, you know. You might go to some churches today, you know, you've got to have a King James Bible, you, you know, ladies can't wear slacks, and they got all kinds of other different rules you have to follow. Well, that's kind of like the Pharisees. Let me just give you an example. Here's three rules that the Pharisees had. One was that a woman could not look into a mirror on the Sabbath day because she might see a gray hair and be tempted to pull it out, and that would be working on the Sabbath. Okay? A second rule. One was allowed to swallow vinegar on the Sabbath as a remedy for a sore throat, but they could not use it to gargle. That would be work. An egg laid on the Sabbath could be eaten, provide, providing one intended to kill the hen that laid the egg. There's something in their rules that said, you know, you're not allowed to eat the mother with the child or whatever. I just, all, these are the kind of rules the Pharisees had. Very, very specific. The third, fourth thing I want you to notice about Nicodemus is he came at night. Now, I don't know why he came at night. Some would say, some suggest, oh, well, you know, it was just a, a busy day. He was busy during the day. Jesus had all the crowds, and so he wanted to have like a private interview. I don't think that. Most people, and I would be there, I think he came out of fear for the Pharisees. This guy was the head of the Sanhedrin. If you look back at chapter 2, what was the last thing Jesus just did? We preached on it last week. He went to the temple and did what? Yeah, throughout the money changers, throughout the table, says, this, this place, I'm going to cleanse this thing because you've made it a horrible place. You're all about raising money, and that's the only thing you care about, and, and, you're, and you're cheating people. He cleansed the temple. Well, you can imagine how that upset all the, the Sanhedrin, who were the main religious leaders over the temple. They were pretty upset. So Nicodemus, one of those leaders, says, let me go see what happens with these guys and why he's doing this kind of thing. And so he goes and talks to Jesus, and I think he went at night because he didn't want to be seen seeing Jesus. So let's take a look at this passage today. We'll, we'll, we're going to read through it, and then we're going to go and actually look through it. There are three exchanges in this section today. 
Nicodemus talks, makes three comments, or asks Jesus three questions. Jesus replies to all three, and in all three cases, Jesus Christ says, truly, truly, verily, verily, or in other words, like, you know, uh, for sure, this is right, you know what I mean? It's like an exclamation point. What I'm saying is important, and we're gonna look at those three exchanges that they have today, but let's all stand, if you will, with me, and let's read God's word this section we're in today. I think we're gonna, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is this side read the odd verses, and this side read the even verses, Read it loud enough so you can't hear the person next to, next to you. However, I think you're a little shy on this side as far as people, so you may have to talk a little bit extra louder on this side to equal out this side, okay? So start with me, if you will, over here, verse one. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born, he, can, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen and you do not accept our testimony. If I hold you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Everybody together on 13? No one has ascended into a heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. You may be seated. I feel like I might need that vinegar to gargle this morning. <laughs> Throat's a little rough. So there are three sections. We're going to go to the very first one. Let's start off right with verse, um, verse 2 here. And it says in this, in this very section here, this is what it reads. The man came to him by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John writes saying, I am showing, I am recording these signs so that you may know and you may believe on the Son of God. So the signs, the miracles that he uses, of which the first one we had was a few weeks ago with the, the wedding at uh, Cana where he turned the water into wine, these signs were, uh, were to prove that he came from God, he was divine, he was God himself. He did all kinds of signs at the Passover, which is where we're at right now in chapter, the end of chapter two. And so he's, uh, Nicodemus has seen these signs and he says, I see these signs so I know you're from God. And he calls him teacher. Now some think he's just, some might think he's just flattering him. I think he really understood and had a real desire as we see in the, in the following comments to know who this Jesus was. Who was this guy that walked into my temple completely unknown, turned over the money changers and tried to clean the temple out and do it right? Who is he? And so he comes to, he comes to Jesus and just makes that statement. Jesus Christ is divine. Jesus Christ does not wait for an answer, uh, for a question. Was that a question that he asked? Guys, if you can put up the first uh, point there. Was that a question? No, it was a statement. We know you came from God because of the signs. And so Jesus jumps right in before he asks a question and replies to him with these words in verse 3. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So he uses truly, truly to try to get um, Nicodemus' attention and say, this is what you have to understand. Unless you're, unless you're um, born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Born again, what does it mean? Well, he's gonna explain that a little later, but he answers his question immediately. This is the starting point. If Christians talk to people, what do they, what do they say, you know? How can I get to heaven? Are you going to heaven? Well, how do you get there? 
That's the starting point of the question. Nicodemus, without them asking that, immediately started that point and gave him the answer. You must be born again, period. Nicodemus thinks about it. Uh, he introduces the phrase here, what's born again mean? Well, how many remember during the Nixon affair? How many were even alive during the Nixon affair? <laughs> you know? Remember, one of the guys who got thrown in the jail was Chuck Colson, okay? Got thrown in jail, became a Christian in jail, and started a prison ministry to bring other prisoners to Jesus Christ. He wrote a book that was called Born Again. And so that term became very popular. But it, was, it comes from this particular sentence right here. Um, a generation is a, is a certain age of people. A woman, when she has a baby, she's generating a baby, okay? Generation birthing a baby. So regeneration, reborn, is what this word is. It's regeneration, it's what the Holy Spirit does. Regeneration, and this word born again can be translated either born again, born anew, or born from above. And it's used from above for many things, for many times. Those three, ver those three terms would all mean the same thing. It's a second birth. It's a spiritual birth, being born again. Now, Nicodemus hears this, and he entirely misses the point, and takes us straight to the second discourse and to his question. If you look in the second exchange here now, in verse 4, Nic this is Nicodemus' reply to that particular statement. How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? He's thinking totally physiologically. You know, you gotta got think. Now, I realize this guy didn't have the New Testament. He didn't have the cross. He didn't know Jesus Christ died on the cross, all this kind of stuff. So this is his first encounter with this guy named Jesus. But he says, you mean I gotta be born again? How do I get back into my mom's womb and be born a second time? Isn't that, isn't that a dumb question? I mean, I would think that was a dumb question. But he, he's totally baffled, has no idea what Jesus is talking about. So Jesus then answers them back with four statements. And we find those coming up in verses five through eight. And he starts these four statements over again with the word, truly, truly, pay attention, is basically what he's saying. He's got four things he wants to tell him. The first thing is, in verse five, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now water could have three or four meanings here from those that have studied this passage. Okay? One thing they say it might mean is of the living water. They think of the woman at the well and so forth. That water is the word. It uh, talks in the Bible about being cleansed by the word of God. You know? And so they say, well, it's, it's by the word. You hear the word, and then the spirit regenerates you. That's what some people think it is. A second thing that some people think it is is that it's, the, it's a means of purification. If you remember back to the wedding of Cana, they had the big jars they filled with, with water. And those jars were purification jars because they had those jars in the homes of the uh, Jews because they constantly washing their hands, you know, having some sort of cleansing going on, purification. And in fact, that was the same thing that John was doing, John the Baptist, when he was baptizing in the Jordan. He was purifying the people, preparing them for the Savior to come. So some believe it was just referring to purification and cleansing. Others go and say, they believe it refers to water baptism. And that certainly could make sense because John had been baptizing, preparing the way for the people. The Pharisees knew about this. Everybody knew. He's, this, this guy's down there baptizing people in the Jordan, you know, immersing them and, and saying, this is, this is uh, you know, you need to get ready for the Lamb of God. And then he points out Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. So some think it's water baptism. However, we know as we look at the scriptures that water baptism is not necessary for salvation. Now, mind you, Water baptism is mandatory for the believer. It's a command of the scriptures. So it's mandatory that we, to be an obedient believer, we need to be following baptism. Some people say, well, when were you saved? Well, you know, I don't know. I, you know. Some people remember a date. Some people remember a service or, or a time period or some place in their life. Some people don't. And, and, but they, nobody usually forgets the day that we're baptized, you know? They made a profession of faith, they spoke with their mouth, and they were immersed in water. That's the public profession saying, I am now a Christian. I publicly am identifying with Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is all about. 
That's what water baptism is all about. Some say this is water baptism. I don't believe that. You're a Baptist. Why don't you believe that? Well, I just don't think that's what he's talking about here. Okay? Water baptism is important, but I don't think he's talking about water baptism because you don't need to have water baptism, water and the Spirit, in order to be saved. Some said that, well, it means water baptism because it means some people were depending on their water baptism for salvation, but you also had to be baptized of the Spirit also. I still don't buy it. This is what I think it means. What did he just say, Nicodemus, to Jesus? Do I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? He's thinking physical birth. And so when a baby is born, and I've been through five births, watching my wife be through them, <laughs> you know, rooting her on, um, when the baby, what do they do? They break the water. Should I tell them about our first experience? <laughs> We were destined to be, we were destined to be uh, induced the next morning, and her water broke halfway through the night, got the bed wet, so she's sitting on the toilet on the uh, trash can, you know, collecting something. Can't we, can't we wait till the morning? We're going in in the morning anyway, you know? The first one, don't know what's going on, but anyway, water is involved. Any woman that's had a baby, or you've watched a woman have a baby, you know that the baby is in it, what's called amniotic fluid, okay? It's water. It's the, it's the sac that protects it. Now, there are some researchers that have looked through and said, water can also mean, and in some context, and they have all these verses that show it, that it can mean, um, it's used, for instance, to be water, rain, dew, drop, and that refers to the male sperm. I don't know if he's talking about that here. I think he's talking about the water that encompasses a, a woman when she has a baby. And so I think when he says, born of water and the spirit, he says, Everyone is born of water, physical birth, but also spirit, a spiritual birth. There are two births. And so I believe that's what he's talking about when he's, when he's talking about this particular section. Unless a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven or into heaven itself. We must have one birth, physical birth, and then to be born again, we need the spiritual birth. Now it goes on in, in verse six to say, and I think this confirms what I'm saying, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, people have been trying to erase the Jews from the face of the earth for years and years. I to just think back to the Holocaust, but that's not the first time and it wasn't the last time. People have tried to exterminate the Jews for years. But the Jews have a very strong descendant line going back to Abraham. If you're Jewish, you know you're Jewish, don't you, pretty much? I mean, there's a, yeah, I'm Jewish. I mean, it's known, and it's a very big deal. And so Nicodemus was a Jew. He identified with Abraham, who was the father of all Jews, and what, he's, what is being said here to him, Jesus is saying, flesh is flesh, and spirit is spirit. You don't evolve from flesh to spirit. In other words, you don't get to heaven by, become, by being a Jew, and the Jews, the only way a Gentile could become, a, become an, uh, uh, right with God was to become a Jew as a proselyte. As a proselyte. So said, no, flesh is flesh, spirit is spirit. You don't get to heaven because of your upbringing. And that's true for us as Christians too. Some people think, you say, well, you're a Christian. Well, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad were Christians, you know. Went to church on Christmas and Easter, uh, you know. I, I'm good, you know. Uh, no. Flesh is flesh, spirit is spirit. You have to make your own decision. You could have been born into a Christian home that does not make you into a Christian business. It's just being a Jew does not make them favor with God. Just like sleeping in the garage doesn't make you a car, okay? Flesh is flesh and spirit is spirit. Don't think that because you went to church, you lived in a good Christian family, or you, you had any kinds of, all, any of that is credit. Flesh is flesh, and spirit is spirit. And that's what he says here in verse six. There is no evolution from flesh into the spirit life. Let me explain a little bit more, Jesus says. Look at verse, if you will with me, look over at verse seven. He says, do not marvel that I said to you, you, what? must be born again. He repeats the same thing he said before, but adds the word must in there. Now, if I say something twice, do you think it's important? Do you think I think it's important? If Jesus Christ says something twice, do you think Jesus Christ thinks it's important? Yes, he's saying, get this through your thick skull, Nicodemus. You must 
be born again. If you want to get into the kingdom of God, into heaven, there's no two ways about it. Some people accuse Christianity and don't like it because it's what they claim exclusive, you know? Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the, and the, no one comes to the Father but by me or except through me. Hands down. And a lot of people, even in our Christian churches, they think, well, if you're a good Buddhist, you're a good Muslim, you're a good Hindu, you're a good whatever it is, you know, uh, you try to be, uh, you're going to get to heaven. That's not what Jesus Christ taught. He said, you must be born again. And if you don't believe that, then you're calling Jesus Christ a liar. You see, there's not a middle ground here. It's not like Jesus is a good person, and yeah, everyone else is going to heaven, but I'm going to go to heaven also, and I'm, and I'm trusting Jesus, but they're trusting their own gods. You know, and say, well, after all, we all worship the own God, right? The same God. Do we worship the same God? No, we do not. Jesus Christ is God. He said, I am the way. So you need to come to the decision, either that is correct or that is incorrect. It can't be halfway. If it's incorrect, then you might as well throw this book away because it's meaningless. If Jesus Christ was wrong, what else can you trust him for? He was either a lunatic or a liar or something like that. So if Jesus Christ says this, we must believe it. We must understand what he says in the word of God. When I was in high school, we had a club called High School High BA, which was for high school born againers. We, we had it on our books or whatever we had. It was kind of a, a discussion people. High school, what's, what's high BA? High BA stands for high school born againers. What's a born againer, you know? This was before Chuck Colson wrote, uh, Colson wrote his book, you know? And we got a chance to explain what it means to be born again. We had a pin we would sometimes wear as a testimony. And the pin said, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. And you understand what that means? Let me try to explain it to you. It doesn't make sense a whole lot unless you think of what Jesus Christ is saying in this passage, born again. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. He's talking about the flesh and the spirit, the physical and the eternal. Let's take a look. I've tried my best at an illustration. Everybody's born once, right? Is there anybody here that wasn't born? Okay, we, we all agree on that part. <laughs> We're all born once, okay? As soon as you're born, you're destined to die. Could be three years old, could be 50 years old, could be 95 years old, who knows? Everyone that's born will die because sin has come across all men for the all sin. I don't think anybody disputes that. But the second we're born, we also are born spiritually dead, separated from God because of sin. If God lets sin into his heaven, it would corrupt heaven and it would be worse than here on earth. I served 26 years in the military my son serves in federal law enforcement. We know that you need people to enforce the law because we don't naturally do it. And if we all, anybody got into heaven that was sinful, it would corrupt heaven. And so sin is not allowed there. And so the first birth creates the first death for sure and also puts us into the second death. Next slide if you would. The second birth that he's talking about here, being born again, cancels out the second death with me? So if you're born once, you've got two deaths. If you get a second birth, two births, the second birth cancels out the second death. Next. We in turn this first death, first birth physical, second birth spiritual, first death physical, second death spiritual. Death is simply separation. When a person dies physically, we're separated body and soul. The body and soul are separated, okay? That's, that's physical death. Spiritual death is us separated from God. We are all separated from God. But the second birth cancels out the second death. And so if you guys will switch to the next version here, spiritual birth turns the spiritual death into eternal life. And next week, Pastor Red will be speaking verses 14 all the way through 21, in which is that very well-known verse that everybody knows, John 3, 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not but have everlasting or eternal life. This is what John is speaking about. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. So the question Jesus is asking Nicodemus, do you have a second birth? And the question I'm asking you on Jesus' behalf, Christ's behalf is, do you have a second birth? Because if you don't, you'll be eternally separated from God forever. And you will never see anyone again who has the second birth. Because they'll be in heaven and you'll be separated from God for eternity. And can I really tell you, it's hell. It's hell to be separated from God. And that's the destiny. So it's up to us if we really believe this to make sure that our friends, our neighbors know it, but that we know it. Because the only way not to believe this is to say, Jesus Christ didn't know what he was talking about. And if you do that, you might as well forget church. You might forget trying to be good because that won't get you to heaven. Let's go on to the next verse here because he has a fourth comment that comes here. He says, verse four, he was still not sure he was going to understand. And verse eight, excuse me, it says, the wind blows where it wishes and you do not hear the sound of it. But do you know where it comes from and where it is going? Oh, you do not know where it's coming or where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. So poor Nicodemus is saying, I don't, you know, this physical, spiritual stuff, I don't understand all the spiritual stuff. I can't see it. How many people have ever heard the phrase, seeing is believing? Okay? Yeah. You can't see it, he says to Nicodemus. You're not going to see it. You've got to take something by faith. You've got to believe that I am here, and we'll find out later, says, I came down to tell you the truth. So you can either believe me or call me a liar. It's your choice. Make yours. So he gives this phrase here today, and it says, you can't see the wind, so you can't see the spirit. Now, do you believe in anything you can't see? How many people believe in electricity? How many people have lights in their house? How many people are awake today? <laughs> you know? Can you see electricity? Some guy walked out of the church, he says, you should have used electricity as an example. He was an electrician. <laughs> you know? You can't see it, but I depend on it. I'll tell you, last week it went out for about 10 minutes and I knew it was gone because we couldn't see our hand in front of our face. How many of other people lost electricity this last week, 10 minutes? Yeah, gone. We're stumbling around, where's the, you know, trying to remember where the flashlights are? Electricity. Jesus says that's what the wind is. Now, you have to understand the word pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. Pneuma is the Greek word for spirit. If you have a disease that starts with the word pneuma, you have pneumonia. Can't breathe, okay? Pneuma is the word, and it's translated either spirit, wind, or breath. Breath, you can't breathe. Those are the three translations. So, it's almost like a pun here, you know? You can't see the wind, Numa, and you can't see the spirit, Numa. They're both invisible, but you can see their effects. Next slide, guys. When I was stationed overseas in Kuwait, I was in a sandstorm. Only one I ever saw. But uh, it was just amazing to me. I mean, I just, I didn't want to, I could have played the video for you here today, but I didn't want to take all the time. It's just amazing. I mean, you can see this thing rolling over. Can you see the wind in this picture? No. What you can see is the effects of the wind. You can see the sand being blown up uh, into the air. I remember I was um, in, the, in one of our like, training events in the military, and a wind gust came along and blew my cap off, my, what they call it, a cover in the military. And it went on the ground, and it kept on blowing around, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to chase the thing. Well, this thing starts going around in circles. Like this, and here I am, like a major, or whatever I am, officer. There. Here I'm trying to—I mean, I must look crazy. Here I'm trying to catch this cat running around in this circle. It was—it got caught in a whirlwind. I didn't know there was a whirlwind there, but I could eventually picked up some dust and I thought, "That's a mini tornado." I couldn't see the wind, but I could see the effects. Next slide. When I was with the 56th Brigade, we got sent for six weeks down to Hurricane Katrina, and we helped with the cleanup and everything else. Unbeknownst to us, the sixth week we're there, Hurricane Rita hit right on top of Hurricane Katrina. This is me in Hurricane Rita. You can see the flag that we have left there just blowing practically off the pole. The wind driving, you can't see the wind, but it's driving the rain and flowing the flag. When Katrina hit, 
I took the tour of the area, that had my Humvee, drove around and took a look at where things were at. This is the kind of devastation that the, we didn't see the wind, but you could see what the wind did. Next. This is um, Slidell, right on the, right on the um, Lake Pontchartrain there. You can see the building on the left, cleared out everything gone, nothing around it, buildings around it, that's all that's left. On the right, there was a tree that came down and crushed that home, a result of the wind. The picture I didn't put there was a, a picture of a house. It was, it was incredible. A house long like this, sliced exactly in half by a tree. The tree must have fallen exactly between the, the rafters and beams and came right down, sliced the thing totally in half. The rest of it was okay, but there was this, this big tree laying right in the center of it. Next slide. This is the, <clears throat> on the right, this is what's left of a house after the wind. I saw this, little, oh, I took all these pictures, except for the one on the left, somebody else took it, I took up a camera for me. You can see that it says 304 A, B, C, D. At that location, there was a four unit building. And look what's left. That's a result of the wind. So you may not be able to see the wind, but you can see the effects. You cannot see the spirit, so I cannot prove to you regeneration, what it means, but I can show you the results. And you see the results by looking at people who have changed their lives and whose effects it had on us. That is the spirit. As we move on, we have the third exchange. And Nicodemus just says one thing, basically, how? Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? He just got no idea. I mean, he's still trying to adjust all this stuff. I mean, you got at least me preaching it for you for 30 minutes trying to explain it. To him. He had none of this. I mean, this was happening in a matter of, you know, five minutes. He's trying to grant, he says, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him with these words. And he gave him basically two replies. The first one is verses 10 through 13, which you're gonna finish up in just a couple minutes here. The next ones are verses 14 to the end of the chapter, which Pastor Ed will take next week. So the first thing we look at here is in verse 10, he, he's kind of rough on him a little. He's not mean, but he just puts it right there. He says, are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? You're a religious leader. You're a master of divinity. You're one of the highest trained guys. All the people of Israel look to you as a member of the 70 member Sanhedrin to know this stuff and to teach it. Hey, you don't know this? I can't believe it. You're so learned. And you know, that's what happens sometimes. You ever, you ever, you ever heard that someone's too big for their britches? You know? Or, or people, they just, they just have so much knowledge that they can't, you know, you're what's, so smart, you're of no common good or whatever, have no common sense. You know what I'm talking about? Okay? Lots of brains, lots of gray matter, but they overthink everything. And Nicodemus was overthinking. He couldn't understand the simplest of stuff. In Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, Jesus Christ brings the little children here. He says, come sit on my lap. He said, unless you become like little children, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. It's childlike faith. I'm a sinner, Jesus was not. Jesus died on the cross for me, I believe. It's as easy as that. But the person that's overthinking, oh, I'm trying to be good, I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to get in heaven, I mean, they're just messing it all up. And so Jesus Christ says here, as he looks at it, you don't understand, in verse 11 he says, again, truly, truly, the third time he says this now, truly, truly, I say to you, we, and when he says, I talk to you, he's talking to you collectively. It's plural there. So it's not just to him, but it's to him and maybe the other Pharisees. I don't know who he's talking to, but he, he says, to you, plural, we speak. Now, who's speaking? Some think it's, well, it's, he means we and the disciples, the four or five he has at this point with him. But, you know, they didn't even get the resurrection until it was over. At this point, they hardly even know that he was God, you know. I mean, they, they're just babies. They've been with him for a few days. When he says we, I think he's talking about the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. We, we speak that which we know, and we bear witness of that which we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. The word witness twice. Jesus Christ says, I have come to be a witness to you, to tell you, but most people don't believe me. Maybe you're like that. He goes on to say in verse 12, and he talks about now, uh, not only about, uh, starts the long verse, not only about the witnesses, but earthly versus heavenly. He says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe me, how shall you believe me if I tell you heavenly things? 
He says, I'm talking about physical birth, getting saved and all this stuff. You don't believe it. You don't understand it. If I go into the deep stuff, I mean about heaven and tell you that kind of stuff, it's going to blow your mind. You'll never understand it. He says, I'm talking about the basic stuff. And then in verse 13, he says this, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who, has, uh, who descended from heaven, even me, the Son of Man. He's saying, nobody, Nicodemus, Pharisees, you, me, none of us have been to heaven. So we don't know what's up there. We don't know everything that's there. But he said, that's why God so loved the world that he sent the Son of Man so that I could come down and explain it to you. John 1.14 says, and God the Word became flesh. Flesh. Born physically. So that Jesus Christ could tell us the truth. Today the question is for us, do we even understand the earthly things? Because there's a lot of heavenly things there too. And the thing he's trying to teach us is, and this is the, my final point today, is the theme that I want you to think of as we go to the, next, the last slide here. Say it with me. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Say it once more. We've got to get in our heads. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. The first de- birth has two deaths. The second birth cancels out the second death and turns it into eternal life. Eternal life doesn't start when we die. Eternal life starts the very moment you accept Jesus Christ because the Bible says you're passed from death into life. Let me ask you all to bow your heads. I don't know most of you intimately to what's in your heart, but I do know most of you otherwise, but I don't know what your background is. And so, I rarely do this, but this is a day when Nicodemus has explained to him exactly the most important truth in the scriptures. And so I'd like to ask you, have you been born again? Have you been born of the Spirit? If not, Jesus Christ says you're headed to a godless eternity apart from Jesus and apart from God, which is called hell. If yes, you have, then you're headed to heaven. First John says, he who has the Son of God has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. It's black and white, simple. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, I'd invite you to make today the day you decide. You can come to this church for years. 30 years I've been here. You can be here the whole time. But unless you know Jesus Christ, knowing Gary Taylor is not going to get you to heaven. So I'm going to give you a chance. Is there anybody who would like to raise their hand? Just and I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call up. But if you, just let me know. It's a kind of private communication between me and you. Yes, I would like to accept Jesus Christ today. I don't know that I've done it before. Anybody? And if you don't want to raise your hand, that's fine. You can just talk to me afterwards. If you're not sure, this is the prayer, and it's not a magic prayer. Just one I know that fits in to the parameters of what you would need to say. One is, dear God, I'm a, I know I'm a sinner and I don't deserve heaven. I know that Jesus Christ did not sin but died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. Please come into my heart, take away my sins and make me one of your children. And then just say amen. Amen. Dear Lord, if there's anybody here this morning that has prayed that prayer or a similar prayer, I pray that you'll help us to be able to have a conversation after this, to be able to lead them on to how be, what being born by the Spirit, born again, means. But if there's anyone here that walks out of this place, may everyone know that they've accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and they're headed to heaven. God forbid that anyone here would be separated from you eternity after hearing what you told Nicodemus. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. We thank you for the salvation that Jesus Christ provided and the explanation that John gave us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.